Okay, folks, so this is actually an episode that I recorded uh, maybe even a couple of years ago. This is back when I was doing a different podcast, and me and my friend Calvin recorded this uh, interview with our friend Howard. Awesome guy. And it's just an episode about how he lost his wife to cancer and what he learned through all of it. And anyways, yeah, super great episode. And it was one that was so good that I didn't want to let it go, even though we didn't, we're no longer doing that, that exact podcast still. I wanted to transfer this one over just because it's awesome. So hope you guys enjoy it. And uh, we'll just dive in and let, let Howie tell his story. Have you ever felt like you have this insatiable curiosity for life? If so, I want to welcome you to the Brunson Experience. A show about nothing in particular, but everything all at once. Join me on my journey to understand the world, ponder the mysteries, and learn from the greats. Um, we just got out of a pandemic, and so a lot of people know or have personally experienced um, a death, either a family member or even a pet or something like that, you know? Hmm. Um, and I've gone through a death in my life, um, a year ago, Mm -hmm. um, my wife passed away from cancer and uh, yeah, she passed away, uh, June 16th of 2021. And, uh, it was a really traumatic experience going through that and I'm still recovering, but, um, just about like. I want to say like a two months ago or something like that. Um, I feel emotionally ready to share um, the experience that I've had and the joys of being married to a cancer patient and all the lessons that I've learned um, from someone so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like people are, uh, I mean, I mean, the fact you bring this up, right? There's, there's a lack of vulnerability. Do you think that's, is that why you think sometimes death, I guess I maybe the right word is, you know, sometimes when a bone breaks, it doesn't set correctly, right? And you've got a crooked arm the rest right, of your life. Yeah. You think that's, yeah, it, for is that me, vulnerability like a, that causes that? That changes that yeah, I think setting correctly? Just death in general yeah. is just more of a t- taboo thing. Like no one yeah. really likes talking about death, even though death is something that every one of us are going to experience. One for ourselves mm-hmm. and later on down the road, right? I just had like the bad luck of having to get experienced at such a young age, you know, at 27 or 26 years old now, I'm 27 now, but, um, yeah. And I just come to realize that we society needs to be a little bit more vulnerable because sometimes we feel like we need to create this picture perfect way to present ourselves. And you can see that in like social media, yeah. you know, um, putting up these like fronts and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. And, uh, but really, we're suffering from the inside, but we don't want to tell anybody because we don't know who's going to listen or make fun of us and stuff like that. Or, you know, just a bunch of things in general. It's just really hard for, to trust somebody, you know? No, definitely. So mm-hmm. when did you meet your wife and how long were you guys married? And kind of, well, maybe give, give me, let's, yeah. let's go through the story here. I'm kind of curious. How did this all, <laughs> give me the build up and how this all, yeah. how this all went down. Perfect. Yep. So I like to say that I have the best love story possible <laughs> because we met at BYU Idaho. There you um, go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, our relationship started like everywhere, right? Just BYU Idaho. We were in the same ward. And, and uh, this was before she had cancer. Okay. What year was and this? We went on a date. This was June of 2019. I think I was up there and... at that time actually. I was at BYU at that time as well. Oh really? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I lived at the gates. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Uh Yeah. And our first date was a day after Thanksgiving. And we just went and grabbed some soda vine, just something Mm -hmm. that was cheap because I was a great college student at the time. There you go. Um, But we just grabbed some drinks and and, uh, just started chatting. And that date lasted for five hours. Like, kid you not, like, I've never planned a date like that. Like, typically, Uh I like to be, like, in a one-hour range and stuff like that. But... We just hit it off the bat super well, and we just That's lost awesome. track of time. And hmm. so she made a really solid first impression on me. I'm all each other, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, but I knew that she was going to graduate in the end of that year, so December of 2019. And so, hmm. like, 
we thought, okay, yeah, I'm only going to see her till the end of this uh, year. And then I'm never going to see her again. Like that was literally our, both of our impressions and stuff like that. Okay. So we're like, you know what? Let's just be friends. Let's just hang out and stuff like that. And then when the year's over, then, you know, we go our separate ways. So was she older than you or was it because of your mission that there was that gap? No, she was older than me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And she liked to say it too. She, <laughs> yeah. That was something she liked to brag about for sure. Okay. So what, what was the age difference then? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just 10 months. Oh, okay. So barely. So really yeah, it was yeah, more like, it was more the mission. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I follow you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. It was more definitely more of a mission, like that. But <laughs> she liked she liked having that title, and I'll let her give it to her as well. Yeah, uh, <laughs> older, wiser. Yeah, yeah, but exactly. And so, so yeah, she went and graduated, and I just went on my uh, regular life. And uh, then February of 2020 happened, and that's when the pandemic started happening, mm-hmm. and that's when she was first diagnosed with cancer. Um, Man. We still kept in touch like every now and again, but it was hard, you know, during um, her cancer treatment because she was going through chemotherapy and stuff like that. But we always uh, chatted over Instagram or even FaceTimed every now and again. Um, and then later throughout the year, things have become a little bit more serious where we started just FaceTiming every single day and talking to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and December, or no, October of 2020, was when she beat cancer for the first time. And this was when she was in Canada. So So, she was diagnosed in uh, California and then she moved to Canada where she's from and then also because it's uh, free healthcare. Gotcha. So she's Canadian. She's Canadian, yeah. Did she tell you Uh right away that she was diagnosed with cancer or did she kind of keep that to herself for a while? No, she told me. Okay. Yeah. Did she... I kind of knew that she wasn't like free, free, feeling very well. Okay. Um, because she was just telling me, you know, that um, she had a lot of pain in her left shoulder and okay. uh, she couldn't run as fast and stuff like that. And the doctors tried to test her with so many things, measles, mumps, you know. Huh. And some people thought she had like the common flu or something like that, but just a little bit extra rare. Um, so was cancer but it was a huge until... shock then when you found out that it was cancer? Yeah. 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 No one knew. Yeah. yeah. And... None of her family has previous history with cancer, and it was mm-hmm. just... What kind of cancer was just it? Just bad acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Okay. So, well, blood cancer. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I am pretty ignorant when it comes to this kind of stuff. Is that one of the tougher <laughs> ones? I mean, because I'm guessing with the blood, you can't really yeah. do much necessarily, right? Yeah, it's super hard because it affected her T-cells. So those are your premature um, cells. Okay. So whenever you're generating blood and stuff like that, right? Um, you have your B cells and your T cells and her T cells were the ones that were affected. And those were the ones that um, uh, you, it's still very early on in the stages of blood, whether it's going to be a white blood cell or red blood cell and stuff like that. And so Mm. um, that type of um, cancer is a lot less researched and it's still something that is really hard to cure at the moment wow plus with all of covid yeah. going on as well like double yeah. stress so, just yeah, stacked up people... exactly yeah. exactly and so Jeez. not just christina but like people in the cancer community just um were really scared for their lives yeah obviously because people were anti-vaxxers anti-maskers and mm-hmm. stuff like that and so like these are some of the people who were like hey like i'm still here i'm like i'm still trying to survive for my life and they're scared of you know walking to a grocery store right um when you have people who you know refuse to wear masks and stuff like that and so yeah it was really challenging for her um, and uh, even the procedures like typically you would be able to wait in the waiting room she had to endure that the whole like alone there was no buddy there to be with her by her bedside and so it's just her alone in her thoughts while she's Scrolling Jeez. through social media or trying to find something productive, you Jeez. know? Yeah. And so you definitely lose some of that uh, social um, support yeah. when you're at the hospital. Mm-hmm. You said she was, she was diagnosed in February and then she beat it in October. Mm-hmm. Did you get married between yeah. that time or when, when, did, when did the no. wedding happen? No, so that, the wedding happened February of 2021. Okay. Yeah. So we were planning on getting married uh, or we were thinking about getting married during the time of like October and stuff like that. That's when we were planning mm-hmm. it. And 
and it wasn't going to be till like the pandemic was going to end. And so that's what we were thinking. Like, because my family lives here in the States and her family lives in Canada, we wanted to find like a nice solid ground where um, the borders would open up and we were able to have a wedding together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it was going to be a massive one. Okay. So, and uh, February of 2021, exactly a year when her, when she was diagnosed with cancer was when it came back. Oh, no way. So it was February 20th. Yeah. Uh -huh. Was when the cancer came back. And in Canada, they don't do second treatments. I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Either. Oh, that wow. is so interesting. So the cool, th yeah. So in Canada, universal healthcare is amazing there, right? right? Um, and it works for them because there's a lot less um, people in Canada than there is here in the United mm -hmm. States. Um, so the quality versus qu quality versus quantity ratio is a little bit better mm -hmm. when it comes to healthcare right. over there. However, you're still at the mercy of the government. And uh, in Christina's situation, when you have a 7% chance of living, um, the government basically just went ahead and said, yeah, we won't fund your treatment. So... You can either pay yeah. for it um, yourselves or we can just send you to hospice. Kind of thing. Okay. So when she first got diagnosed, what was her chance of survival? Her chance of survival were 50-50. Okay. And you were talking about marriage. Yeah. So this is kind of a tough question, but I'm really curious. This seems like yeah. for you, this could have been a tough question as well, right? Um, with, with you guys talking about marriage and her not sure if she's going to be around, how did that all play out? Yeah, so for me, it was just, and this is not like a message that I think I like to give to people who are still single, mm -hmm. you know, and are one are like you know stressed out to find like marriage and stuff like that. I mean, obviously, everybody's marriage is completely different, but what worked for me was it was a no brainer. Mm -hmm. It was the easiest decision I've ever made. And so like, and I think that was like the beauty of being married to her was like, I knew the risk that, um, there was a 7% chance of her, you know, um, dying, but I knew that I needed to learn and grow from this amazing woman. And I would take those chances of being with her then. Me just saying, yeah, I can't do this anymore. Let's break up. Like, I could never see myself doing that. And when you're involved in the cancer community, you get a lot of people whose relationships are severed because they were diagnosed yeah. with cancer. And I, I have yeah, friends that happen And I don't too. blame them yeah. because it's something that's, mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't blame them and stuff. Like, and it's, it's a very hard world to enter. But for me, it was just, I love this girl so much that, you know, I was willing to take that risk. And I knew the risks, you know, worst case scenario, she was going to die. I just didn't know I was going to hurt this bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mm -hmm. February is when it came back. And then Rome again, when, when were you married? So February 20, 20th was when uh, she was okay. diagnosed. And then February 26th was when wow. I got married. That's like a whirlwind yeah, of so emotions. So she told me that. Yeah. Yeah, so that Monday was when she told me, like, and I still remember, I was still working, and uh, um, she called me. She was like, hey, do you have a place to sit down? And, and I said, yeah. And so I just sat down, you know, I was like, we're ready to hear, you know, some like news and stuff like that. And she said that her cancer relapsed, 7% chance of living. And, and the doctors gave her three months to live. Oh, jeez. And that there was no cure. Gosh. And so... um. She basically said, how are you? Like, I'm really sorry to he tell you this. You know, I wish I had better news. If you want to break up, that's totally fine. I totally understand. You know, um, these past couple months that we've been together has been one of the best times of my life. And, uh, you know, whatever decision you make, I completely understand. And I said, cool. Well, we're getting married still. So and I'm going to find the closest ticket to Canada and we're going to do this thing. And that, oh, that is just wild, man. Holy smokes. I can't even imagine oh, yeah. a phone call. Like... Yeah. Oh, yeah. After that call, like, I literally was, like, on the floor, like, curled up like a baby and started to cry and stuff like that. Jeez. Like, my mom had to pick me up from, from work oh, and goodness, stuff like that. Man. So that, 
I can Gosh. go like home and stuff. And so, oh. yeah, at that point, like I quit my job. I told mom, bye to my mom and I started packing my bags within the week that, you know, I had time to prepare. That was the longest week I've had. Like, honestly, I've never had seven days or six days. Yeah, go by so mm-hmm. slow. But yeah, um, I had a good friend of mine there who actually bought me a ticket to, and this is literally like what comes out of a rom-com movie. My friends book a ticket from Salt Lake City to Seattle, and I took a bus from Seattle to the north part that they will able to reach me. I think it was called like uh-huh. Farmsdale or uh-huh. something like that. And from there, I had to take an Uber just 30 minutes to the border. And I grabbed like my luggage, stuff like that, so that I can get across the border so I can find um, uh, my future sister-in-law. Is that because you couldn't fly directly in? <laughs> right. So that yeah. was the only way you could uh, really get the border was still across closed. the border was the Uber up. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's and awesome. We had, to, so in Canada, it's more of a socialist country. So the concept mm-hmm. of marriage um, is a little bit different there. Like if you've been together for a year, technically you're officially married. Wait, you mean right? like legally? Like and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. You don't need to be mm-hmm. like, really need to like oh, have a social like wedding, wedding okay. ceremony. Yeah. Huh? That's all you need. You just need to prove you've been yeah. like, if living you just together go for ahead. a year. Okay. You're married now. That's. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Exactly. And th- that worked a lot in our favor because we're like, oh, yeah, like we've been together since, you know, we just said uh, June mm-hmm. of 2019. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and that kind of gave me permission to do something called an extended family exception form, which grants me as an American citizen permission to mm-hmm. enter Canada because mm-hmm. nobody could have gone right. there this, uh, for because the borders were closed and wow. so. But because I was in a relationship for her, like over a year, technically mm. I was married to her. Yeah, that's how I was able to find that loophole. So hopefully the Canadian government doesn't <laughs> hear this. <laughs> you like some banging on the door. Like, hey, we found out. <laughs> oh man! Well, oh, that is that is some loopholes. <laughs> Holy smokes! Yeah. Were you nervous that you were going to get in yeah, trouble yeah. with anything or get kicked out or anything like that? Or I mean, they probably don't care that much though. Like more just the COVID probably thing. They right? so. Yeah, more of the COVID thing, but just I don't, the Canadian border in general. Like, if you've like crossed the Canada, they're really strict mm-hmm. on like um, who who people they let in and out. Even like Canadians yeah. alone, like have a hard time crossing yeah. their own border and stuff. Okay. I, yeah, I've never been to Canada, so um, that's interesting. I, I didn't I didn't realize they were. Yeah, you're gonna have an argument probably with the border people really? whenever you okay. go there. So <laughs> oh, that's yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you might have all the documents correctly and stuff like that, and they still might be, you know, uh, pretty aggressive towards you. So, but I told them my story and stuff like that, and, and uh, it didn't actually work out with one officer. And then I had to go to a female officer, and I told her my story um, that uh, my girlfriend was diagnosed with cancer, and I'm just gonna go out there to marry her and stuff like that. And she loved it, wow. so she let me. Wow, go. that's so, awesome. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. did you guys, yeah, so you then, were married in Canada. Yeah, then, we got married in Canada. where'd you go from there? So, yeah, from there, we stayed at her parents' place. Um, they were just kind enough for us to live the early um, few mm-hmm. weeks of our marriage there. Um, but we knew that we still wanted Christina to be alive. So her being there for hospice and stuff like that wasn't um, part of the deal. And so we wanted to look for a second opinion. And during this time, Christina and I were just fasting and praying to see what options we could think of. And that's when we got the impression to move to Texas, Houston. And there's an amazing institution there called MD Anderson Cancer Center. And it is... One of the coolest cancer centers in the world, in my opinion. They they really care about the cancer patient and they really care about you know and trying to resolve just this god awful mm-hmm. disease. So yeah, we saved up some money, we created a GoFundMe and stuff like that, and we posted it all on our social media and uh, we got enough for us to 
buy a plane ticket and to go to Houston, get an apartment and uh, get you know, started with her. Um, How was her health treatment this time? Over there? I mean, was she visibly deteriorating or was she still fairly normal? Yeah, it was. No, she was fairly home. No, I mean, yeah, it was deteriorating, but it will goes like off and oh, okay. on kind of thing. So, yeah, depending on the treatments that she's had, like during like chemo radiation and stuff like that, that's when she was like the hardest and stuff. Um, so it wasn't the cancer necessarily that you were I, seeing she does the, get, the change in her. It was the treatments that were probably affecting her more day to day than than the cancer itself. Yeah, the treatments gotcha. and the type of drugs okay. that she was taking too. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a drug mm-hmm. called prednisone yeah. and it's a steroid and, and it gives you a okay. lot of energy. Um, asteroids do, but um, uh, yeah, she would. Uh, so that's when she became a little bit more fun and had like a lot of energy and stuff like that. And she became mm-hmm. a little bit more of herself. Um, but then when she was off of that, then that's when she started becoming a little bit weak. And uh, prednisone actually makes you kind of look a little bit fat. It's not actual fat, it's just water, excess water. Oh, really? um, that's one of the side effects. And so whenever you see cancer patients mm-hmm. who are kind of like chubby and stuff like that, um, or that's typically the excess water hmm. um, that's there um, because cancer patients like gain weight and lose weight like up and down. So you really don't know like how healthy they are based on their body weight because they can either be like on a drug or just been taken away gotcha. from a drug okay. kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. so crazy ups and downs yeah. though with... Her health, her energy, yeah, crazy. Um, did a lot of them affect her mood and yeah. kind of her, like even even her personality? Yeah, because you're saying the prednisone almost seemed um, to bring it back a little bit. Her right? personality was still there. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. Her personality was always there, mm-hmm. but it was mm-hmm. just the mood that she was in. Yeah, and I actually have experience in um, being in the medical field okay. and stuff like that. So I, my first job that I had was um, a CNA. And so I have always taken care of a lot of patients and worked with these drugs and narcotics and stuff like that. So I felt like there was no better guy to be in her life at this moment than me. So it was on, it was truly an honor um, to be her husband and to spend um, those last few months. So this is what her. I'm really curious about then. I'm thinking, okay, if I were there, I'd have some part of me that was just holding out that there was going to be a miracle, right? You've, you've probably been an active yeah. m- member. You've, you served a mission. It sounds like you're thinking, okay, I've done my, yeah. I've lived my life right. Like, yeah. am I going to get some, you know, some, some miracle as a result of this? Is, was that the case for you? Right. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, what I thought, especially like with, the, just just answer the question that you had before. We were only married, uh, like, officially, like, three months and 20 days. Yeah. So, um, everything that I'm telling you, like, up to this point now, has just been within the three months and 20 days. So, we moved to Texas in April of 2021, not knowing that in June of that year, she would pass away. Um, But, yeah, to answer that question, actually, um, Calvin played a really huge role because he introduced me to the Chosen at that time. And this was right around like general conference um, in April where I started like binge watching it with okay. Christina. That's my wife's name. And uh, yeah. And um, I just had a sudden impression that um, everything was going to be okay and that God was going to heal her and that um, we were going to have a family together. And... Uh, that's what I would say a lot in uh, the blessings that I would give to her. And uh, for the longest time, like I would, you know, beat myself up for it because, you know, I thought that maybe I was confused as to why, you know, I received this sort of impression and I got the opposite result. You know, I would think like, Oh, maybe it was like my own, you know, revelation and the thing that I wa- wanted Maybe I wasn't lining my will to his, you know, like, and so the thing that kind of gave me a little bit more hope or what helped me sleep at night is that she needed someone like that. Mm. Like she needed someone who was optimistic 
to tell her every day that, you know, she's going to make it through this. She was, you know, that we were going to be raising a family and, and that we were going to be able to travel the world together, you know, and fill her mind with um, hopes for the future than the pains that she must be feeling. And so during our marriage, I promised myself to make Christina laugh every day. And if I could do that, I knew that I won the day because I knew for that split second, she wasn't worried about um, her next cancer treatment or when her pills are need, she needs to take, when she needs to take pills, right? She was focused and present at the moment. And that was one of the most valuable lessons that I've learned from her. Wow. Nice. Like, that's, honestly, that, that's the, funny. that, well, I mean, I, yeah, go with Cal. Uh, no, I was just going to say that's one of my favorite just uh, takeaways that I've heard you talk about, Howie. Just if you're able to make her smile, laugh, forget about that pain, yeah. then that was a, a day, a, a successful day. That, yeah, I just love that. And it's honestly true. And uh, honestly, anything. I mean, you just focus on mm -hmm. those simple things and, and life is life is a lot simpler that way. Yeah. What are you saying there, Brunson? Well, and our society is so oh, geared sure. towards selfishness. You know what I mean? Um, so mm -hmm. those of you, I mean, I, I feel like I have to kind of preface this. Um, and in the faith, which ironically, it seems like we, we bring on so many guests that are of our same faith, but me and Calvin both share our faith. So it's just unsurprising that way. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, you go serve a two-year mission where you really yeah. give a lot of yourself. Most guys, well, and girls, they come back, and this mm -hmm. is pretty normal for everyone collectively, or, or, you know, in, in our society, especially in this generation. You come home, and for the next five, six, seven, eight years, you're obsessed with yourself because society's kind of made it that way, right? Like, you mm -hmm. you are all in. It's like, oh, it's my right. career, my job, my, my degree, my work, my tiny little, you know, college budget, and I have no money, and you're, you become very self-absorbed. Yeah, I did, my dad always told me he said people that return home from their missions are the most selfish people for the next like three years. That it just is like they become <laughs> extremely selfish people. For you to go through the exact opposite, yeah, where your whole life and every moment yeah. is, I have to keep a smile on this person's face. I mean, it, like what? A, I mean, like a complete one one eighty compared mm -hmm. to the normal RM, you know, return missionary experience. That had to have completely reshape yeah. the way you look at the world. I feel like just that alone, just that one piece, right? Yeah. Well, kind of. I mean, so mm -hmm. I've always had this type of mentality, right? And uh, like for me, it was actually hard to even think of myself because growing up, like mm -hmm. I'm the oldest of two younger siblings and my parents got divorced okay. when I was 10 years old. So at a very young age, I had to fulfill a father figure role for my sisters. And so for me, it was really hard to think about myself because I was so worried about taking care of my two younger sisters. So I've always had that idea. But the thing is, is that it came to a point where I focused too much on other people um, for everything, essentially, right? And I didn't know my own worth. And so it wasn't until I got to college where I started to learn to love myself, to put myself like in first priority and stuff like that. Um, and uh, when I met Christina, like I knew that I needed to learn something more from her because she was that kind of person. She was the type of person who knew her worth, who was just super confident. Like whenever, this is the type of girl that whenever someone walks into a room, she has a very strong presence and other guys are nervous really? because she's there. Yeah, she had a very like, <laughs> like an alpha, I guess, I don't know, to okay, put yeah. it in the lack mm -hmm. of a better terms, like an alpha mentality kind of thing, like, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, and she, you know, had that, and I was just completely drawn to her because of it, because I wanted a little bit more with the, mm. for what she had, you know, like, how are you so that confident, you know, how are you like that, and uh, I think that's one of the biggest lessons that Christina's taught me, was just um, how great of a person I am. And how much, uh, 
how much I need to contribute to the to this world because I know without my contribution, mm-hmm. this world would be a lesser place what, without it. What do you what do you find? I mean, going through this especially, what did you find is the balance? Because I think it's I mean, this is something I struggle with all the time. I'm not deny that that do you do you put yourself first and make sure that you're healthy or do you are you selfless, right? I mean, that's kind of and those are competing values based on generations, right? Like my parents' generation it was all about Yeah, you know you know, put others first. And that's just a fundamental belief. And this generation is all about your emotional health matters, you know, kind of get yourself right first. Cause if you're not healthy, you can't help others. What did you kind of learn yeah. about those, those kind of bouncing points? Right. Uh, generally like, do you mean life, like, like in yeah, dating and stuff like you really that? Or like, just as your mentality shifted, general. like, no, I okay. need to make myself yeah. the priority first to make sure that I'm healthy or kind of where, where did your mind shift with going through all of this? Yeah. So mine was a little bit like in the middle, like for me, like, especially like going with Christina, right. The first moment, like I, I knew her, right. I was drawn to that confidence and I knew it's something that I needed to learn from. So the way that I kind of viewed our relationship, right. Was that, um, this is someone that I want to be closer to because, um, I know that she's going to make me a better person. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking about myself as well, but at the same time, I knew that, I would be able to benefit. I would give her a lot of um, benefits as well. I don't know. I hate to say it's like kind of no. like a negotiation where there's it's like symbiotic. You know, it's got to be, but you it's kind of like a yin yang. Whenever you are in a relationship, yeah, exactly, yeah. You know the things that she lacks, I get, I have. You know, and uh, I mean, I know in the church, right? There's no such thing as a soulmate. I think, I think that's an. I think that's an. I think that's an opinion point. Christina that's what they. That's, a, that's what that's what had to say to get people to get married because everyone's yeah. too stressed about it. <laughs> yeah, I like what you for said. For real, for real, but yeah, for me and Christina, I honestly feel like it was written in the stars. Like, mm. yeah. Sorry, guys. I think Go I ahead, got Cal. a little bit of a delay. I don't mean to be interrupting or anything, but. No, you're good. Uh, how you said that you had something to offer her and she had something to offer you. That reminds me of what's on your arm. Uh, do you want to give a little bit of backstory about uh, your tattoo? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. I'm probably one of the few people who are. Well, this is interesting. I want to hear more. About, show me the tattoo. tattoo. Yeah, I'm very curious um, about this. Yeah, so it's I on my put on my right glasses here. to my screen's too far to away like here. Change it here, get some lighting and stuff. I don't know, bro. The quality of light in this thing is pretty bad and stuff. So um, this is actually a cheesy enough, like, a <laughs> quote from General Conference. <laughs> but uh, um, it's from a talk oh, called I know the one. Yeah, send, That's or, a good one. Yeah, we'll send together mm-hmm. um, by Linda K. Burson. Yeah. And in this quote, it says, all is thee yeah. and thee lift me and we shall ascend together. And when we were dating, doing the long distance relationship, um, that was one of the biggest um, impacts that I kind of shaped our marriage. You know, um, we obviously, you know, surface level, this is marriage is like a triangle. The closer you guys are to God, the more unified your relationship was going to be. But when Christina passed away, that message kind of took on a whole different meaning. For me, it was when Christina was alive, I did everything I could to help her ascend up to heaven. And now it's her turn for her to do to me when I'm here in this, however long I'm here on this earth and stuff. And so whenever I'm struggling and, uh, you know, having anxiety and depression and stuff like that, I just look at my arm. And uh, I see that it was, no, no ri- it, it's in her handwriting and uh, I just, yeah. And so it's kind of, for me, it's more of like a CTR ring. Like it gives me strength and remembers like my covenants that I've made with my heavenly father when we got sealed in the temple. And it just helps me to uh, give me that extra strength to um, continue on. And uh, some people think it's a bad idea because I have a tattoo, but I mean, when you put it that way, it's really hard, you know, to say no against it. Or That's say what you that say. Hey, you this is from general conference. You have strong relax. opinions against yeah. it, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is from general conference, right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Next time you'll see me with a CTR. Well, and right and the funny thing just... about that is that, I mean, <laughs> uh, Calvin, did you have something to add there? I'm sorry. There's a bit of a, we have just a little bit of a lag, but. There is a little bit of a lag. Go for it. 
Oh, I, my, yeah, my thoughts always been that this happens a lot though. I mean, this is, this is me getting on my little pulpit as well here for a second, but so many of these rules, um, we, we take them across a, a wide range of people and we make it into this crazy, crazy big thing in our minds. Like the no tattoo thing is for those that are not LDS and those that are not part of the, you know, that know much about the kind of the, the, the Mormon religion. Um, that's usually a pretty big no in the religion is don't get tattoos. Right. But the problem mm -hmm. is that, yeah, people take to extremes in their mind and they forget the reason it was there in the first place. Right. It was respect your body. Like that's like, that's the idea is respect your right. body. And how you choose to do that is really between you and God at the end of the day. And is there anything more respectful you put on your arm than something like that? At least right. for me, I'm like that, no, that makes sure. a lot of sense. Like that is, that's 100% appropriate for my, for my perspective, yeah. you know? So mm -hmm. have you had people give you a hard time about mm -hmm. it? Yeah. I'm actually curious. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So a lot of people have been giving me like a hard time about it, but then right when I tell them like the story and stuff like that, then they kind of yeah, just lighten yeah. up a bit. Sometimes they apologize <laughs> and stuff. So, yeah. But I'm curious, Calvin, like what resonates with that was, tattoo? Uh, um, well, just something about, about you. I mean, you are a lifter is what I, the only thing I can refer to it as. I mean, whenever I'm around you, and I hear your optimism. You tell the story. Uh, when we were in Guatemala, uh, we were in Guatemala, was it uh, two months after Christina passed away? Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah, August? about two months afterwards. And um, yeah, how we, how yeah. <laughs> you just mm -hmm. uh, are always a, a lifting presence. Um, and then. I, I I try to do the same, you know, I try to lift people and have a good attitude, but then there's sometimes when it just gets really hard, you know, and you need to be lifted yourself. And so I just love that balance of um, lifting each other, being your best self and, and lifting each other. And um, yeah, like you were talking about that, that triangle there. Um yeah, and and as somebody who tries to lift up, lift others, uh, when that gets hard, you know, I, I'm sure you've experienced this. I mean, you were talking a little bit about grief. I'm I'm curious if you want to dive into the grieving process at all. Um, what what was that like? Did you did you feel like you kind of lost your? Uh, Umph and and uh, optimism for a little bit, or that's what I was curious about. Yeah, for sure. You know, um, yeah, I think this would be a good segue to tell you um, mm -hmm. the way that she died as well. I mean, obviously, you know, it's from cancer, but the day that she passed away, um, I was working, and my brother-in-law and called me during the middle of my lunch break and Christina had to be rushed to the hospital the day before because um, the procedure is if there's anything that's abnormal um, that's going on in a cancer patient, immediately take them to the ER. And so oh, last, yeah, so it was June 15th of 2021 um, was when she was feeling you know, an involuntary shake on her leg. And she didn't know why. And so um, my mother-in-law, who was living with us at the time, uh, took her there. And yeah, um, overnight, and I just stayed back and worked. Um, my brother-in-law called me and said, hey, um, Christina isn't looking very well, good, looking very well. And we don't know if she's actually going to make it um, past the day. And... and uh, I got on the quickest Uber ride <laughs> and skipped the whole line that was um, um, in the lobby. And I said, and I told them, I'm like, yeah, I need to go to the ICU. I don't know if my wife is going to make it today. And there, um, with that same urgency that I had to see her, they took me um, to her room and uh, I just saw her and an induced coma. Um, and... Uh, she was on a ventilator. She had lumen catheters all over her body. And uh, 
the head nurse came to me and said, oh, are you Howard? And I said, yeah, yeah, that's me. And she said, okay, well, we need you to make a decision. Either we try to save her life oh, right geez. now or we pull the plug. Completely up to you. Yeah, and this is before I didn't know anything, right? And so, like I said, wait, step back. What's going on? Like, I haven't even got briefed on the situation. And so, um, at 3 o'clock in the morning, um, her leg started shaking up again. And she was getting really scared. And the, the doctors had to put her in induced coma. She had to get three to four bags of blood so that we can keep her alive. And to figure out what was going on. And... And we found out that the blood cancer was going up and filling up her lungs um, with fluid. And it was growing super fast that it was surrounding her heart. And it's eventually going up to her brain. And every single time they try to take a blood sample and stuff like that, um, the cells would die off before it would reach the lab. And... Uh, at that point, it was really hard to find one place where we can cure because there was three organs that were, you know, um, dying in the, at the same time. And they just told me, um, and it's our professional opinion, that um, we would encourage you to pull the plug. Um, but we can't do that because, you know, that's a decision that you had to make. And at 26 years old, being three months and 20 days into marriage, you know, um, I had to make that hard decision and I told the um, nurses to pull the plug. And to this day, it's been the hardest decision of my life and super traumatizing. How, how long did you, how long did you debate that? I mean, was it, was it, an, was it kind of like, I know this is right, but I can't do it. Or were you actually going yes and no back and forth the whole time? Like kind of what was your brain doing? Oh, yeah. No, I was going yes and no back and forth. Um, and uh, the question that came into my mind was, I just told the doctors, I'm like, listen, like, um, do you feel like you did everything you could to try and save my wife's life? And they said yes. And my mother-in-law said, yeah, they, a nurse has been present with her since three o'clock this morning. Like, there wasn't anybody that was, you know, not there with her. Um, looking after her um, and that kind of gave me that reassurance of like okay like what did your mother-in-law think so she she to in on that decision? Was, yeah just gonna ask okay yeah she um, it was mutual it, it was the same well, go same ahead. question yeah did you make the decision with your mother-in-law hmm. yeah yeah, it was a mutual decision. Legally, but it had to be you. She couldn't correct? make it. It was, it was me. Yeah, legally, it had to did, be me. Did you yeah, debate whether or not her. Christina would? Yeah. Did you think, oh, is she? You know, what would she do in the situation? Yeah. No, I was praying for a miracle that yeah. time. Like I was hoping, like it's something out of a movie or something like that, where <laughs> like. Yeah, a tear would fall off on yeah. her skin or something yeah. like that, and just like that would give her life or something. And, and you have to keep you know, believing like, that, right? Like yeah. that's you have yeah. to. Like I mean, and during and so to to have that because really it was yeah. like I don't know. I can see I, at least for me, I can be like, oh man, but am I giving up? Am I giving up too early? Is there a miracle that's still going to happen? Because you know everything empirically is saying like this is not going to. She's on her way out. But are, were you holding out for a miracle? Was that was kind of what the debate was? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was holding out for a miracle, you know. Um, the doctors told us that, you know, even though she's unresponsive, like, you can still mm. talk to her spirit, you know. Like, she can still listen to you, but... What, just, what do you mean by that? Like, or that a spiritual thing, or that she could actually like hear you in the coma? Um, yeah, so whenever you're in an induced coma, like, you can still, like, listen to like your surroundings and stuff like that. I didn't know that. Um, but because you're in induced coma and stuff so that's like not that, like that's not like a spiritual um, thing. That's like an actual like medical thing that yeah. you can hear while mm -hmm. you're in induced coma. At least coma. that's what the doctors told me. Yeah. No way. Wow. I think so. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Yeah. No, Someone I mean, can that's... correct me if I'm wrong and stuff like that, but. 
yeah, they just told me that, yeah, yeah. you can talk to her and she'll listen to you. Um, but yeah. So I don't know if the doctor said that because, you know, yeah. to soothe my comfort or something like that, or if it's medically Have you ever accurate, had any so. moments since then I'm not sure. that you... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you, th I guess, did you ever question your decision after that? Yeah. For the longest time, like oh, I beat wow. myself up because I thought I was the one that killed my wife. Why did you feel that way? Yeah. Because I was the one that did it, you know, I was the one that told them, you know, to pull the plug and stuff. And I basically gave up, you know, that's, you know, I'm a very person, something that I'm learning or work, learning to overcome is just, um, is not being so hard on myself and to be a little bit more compassionate with myself. And so, um, at the beginning of all this, like, like I, there were so many times where I just wanted to apologize for everybody who knew Christina and, and yeah, basically just said like, I'm so sorry that I made this decision. Like and you I didn't want to this apologize to happen and stuff like that. Cause it was and, your fault, today. you know, quote unquote, right? A lot of them like, wow. Yeah. Oh, geez, yeah. I felt the need to apologize. Totally screwed your brain yeah. up then. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's, but I'm glad that I was able to have people, you know, who cared about me and who said like, don't pl put this on yourself. Like, yeah, you know, you know like she had 7% chance of living. Exactly. So. I was just going to Cancer ask, did this, uh, not you kind of thing. What, what has helped you since, since this, I mean, over this past year um, to, yeah, grieve and heal, I guess. Yeah, so during, you know, the one year, you know, that she's passed away, like, I think for a large, like, six months and stuff like that, like, I was just alone by myself and, you know, allowing myself mm -hmm. to cry and stuff like that, you know, or for, like, like, the first two months, I would say, right? Like, I isolated myself from everybody and I just took that time to just, you know, cry and uh, um, to feel all the emotions and stuff and... And that's when Calvin reached out, you know, um, for that trip to Guatemala. And I knew that it was the opening chapter of um, my life to continue on without her. And so I kind of took this trip to Guatemala as a closing chapter of my life with Christina and uh, the opening of a chapter of me being a widow. This, yeah. when, when did this all happen? When when did you fly out to Guatemala? Okay. That's On right. August 3rd. Okay. We, we, and they, it was her birthday too. We sang her Or 4th, birthday. something like that, yeah. Huh? Yeah, the she was born on August 3rd. That was, that was kind of, that was really special. Yeah. Wow. Did mm -hmm. it? Yeah, I, I'm I'm still kind of tripping yeah. over that um, that amount of responsibility that you would put on your put on yourself, and I can see that too. Like, even though I'm sure logically you're going, no, no, no this is not my fault, but emotionally to feel like yeah. there could have been a miracle, there could have been something else, there could have been another step, there could have been something that I may have yeah. missed. I made this decision. I may have just, you know, I may have killed. Yeah, right. I can see that. I mean, what an unfair place to be. Were you? I mean, I'm, I'm curious. Were you bitter, yeah. Cod? for putting you in that situation because it feels like you were just in an un, like there's a situation that's like a no-win situation you know what i mean huh yeah yeah i was definitely angry at god like you know for one like mm -hmm. right not receiving the first impression that i had you know like that she was going to be healed and starting a family like you know and, and uh, you could say that i had kind of like a faith crisis you know oh. of like not like within the church and stuff like that, but just like my relationship with God and how I viewed like my relation or the priesthood and stuff like that. Cause you know, I thought that I had the priesthood and I was able to help her out and 
you hear all these cool stories, you know, people, you know, being healed and stuff like that and the, to the priesthood. But when I did it, like she died and uh, like, I wasn't doing anything bad, you know, like I was definitely, you know, worthy, um, free sip holder and stuff like that. But yeah. to see it come out that way, you know, I was definitely livid. Did you blame yourself or God more? Do you think? Mm -hmm. Myself. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely blame myself a little bit more. Um, and I came to the realization that, you know, the miracle wasn't that she was going to die or that, you know, she was going to live, but, um, the miracle was honestly every day that she was alive, that I got to be with her was a miracle. Um, and, uh, that I was able to make her last few days on earth or last, you know, the last three months and 20 days has been. Even with struggling with like the, the disease, she still found life. joy in it. Like that's, yeah, that is yeah. something, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so like, if there's anything like I'm proud of, that's awesome. like it's marrying that woman. And I tell people like, you know, if, if I had to go back and redo that decision and stuff like that, I would. And yeah. knowing the fact that she was going to die on June yeah. 16th and stuff, I'd still do it again. Funny enough, I think that's like, that's a lot of things, isn't yeah. it? You no know, regrets. In the moment, you're like, why? I don't know. Did you ever in the moment kind of go, man, you know, I did the right choice? You know, I, I guess, did you ever question it during the time? Mm hmm As you're going through all this, do you think, man, this was, this is pretty rough? Like my marriage or? Got in over my head? No. Okay. No. No. Yeah. yeah. I think one thing as well is like, I got married at age 25 and I think my brain was fully developed then, you know, where like, if there was like any sort of like arguments or something like that, that I had with like Christina and stuff like that, cause we did, you know, like my marriage, obviously, you know, to me it was, it's perfect and stuff like that, but it wasn't always like, you know, that we never had an argument or anything like that. Cause you know, she was, she grew up a non-member in Canada. I grew up as a member in a um, Latino culture. So we had to learn how to adapt these two worlds that we both lived in and create our own one. And so, um, but the benefit, I guess, with me being married at age 25 was that we learned how to communicate. We knew that our, yeah. that it was more of like a us versus the problem, you know? And so... Whenever we had like discussions or like arguments or disagreements and stuff like that, we had that mindset of like, yeah, it's us versus the problem. And so, yeah, we needed to figure out and, you know, gain an no, understanding definitely. from no, each other makes... so that we can resolve this issue. Yeah. And stuff. So, yeah, we were very mature about it. And uh, I would encourage. I was going to ask about that, actually, because like, that's a big debate, man. I mean, that's something that, that we uh, like in our, I mean. Again, I have to preface this for our listeners that in the LDS yeah. culture, I, what do you, what do you, what would you say the average, what is considered uh, an acceptable age to get married in LDS culture? Yeah, it's insane. <laughs> twenty to twenty-two. It's actually really crazy, and the rest of the world yeah. hears this and we're cold. Yeah, it's super it's young. Twenty, like that's insanity. But yeah, nobody. Yeah. 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 And like the United States, like it's yeah. 50, 50, no, I think it's like over, yeah. you know, higher than 50% chance that all yeah, marriages seriously divorce. And if you're going to yeah, surgery exactly with those right. options, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like nope, nobody. Well, and it's funny. Cause yeah, I mean, you'll get, you'll see a guy get yeah. married at 20 and like, wow, I mean, yeah, he's okay. Like it's, I think, I think there's like a little bit of a, oh, he's a little young, but no one thinks, oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Anywhere else in the world. It's like, you are out of your mind. Even 25 people say you're out of your mind. Right. So yeah. there's, there's definitely something with that. Yeah. I've, I've had that belief right. for a while as well. I'm like, you know, right. No, for um, sure. cause I mean, I'm, I'm 26 now I'm single and I mean, I get, you know, and everywhere it's kind of, it's all very playful. Everyone kind of teases me playfully, but I think to some degree, yeah. I'm kind of wondering like, Oh, is there something wrong with him? You know what I mean? Like <laughs> what's, what's he doing? Not, what's he doing? Not married at, at such a, such a mature and ripe oh, age. Oh, for you know? sure. For sure. Yeah. There's. Okay, here's here's another question for you. Okay, no, this is so something that happens true. to everyone I know that goes through something really tough. Yeah. Um, 
did you have kind of a reawakening, like a re, mm -hmm. I'm going to call it a baptism of your faith, where you had to rethink what you believed, rethink the church culture and rethink religious culture? Did that ever happen mm -hmm. to you? Just with all the trauma that you went through? What, how, how did that all piece out for you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I did. Um, yeah, so the way that I kind of um, reshaped, you know, my decision and stuff. And like I said, to go through the faith crisis light, it was, in my opinion, it was mm -hmm. like, okay, do I continue, you know, being in this church, you know, um, mm -hmm. knowing that I'm still like angry at God and, you know, everything that just happened to me, right? Or, you know, do I stay? And uh, the, that's still something that I'm exploring to this day. Like I'm not like fully, fully like, yeah, I'm not going to say that the church is a hundred percent true or anything like that anymore. Right. Because, you know, from, I guess like my experience and stuff like that, like mm -hmm. I've come to the realization yeah. that really like no church is perfect, not even ours, you know? And the yeah. the leaders of our church yeah. mm -hmm. are also human, mostly men, but you know, imperfect as well. And the um, but that's all that you know. I did draw back, you know, that like um from that quote from Jeff Yar Holland right. it says like imperfect. How frustrating must be that he has to deal with us. Yeah. And it's super annoying, but yeah. he deals with it. <laughs> you know? And yeah. Exactly. Right. And so the way that I kind of viewed myself to stay in the church was to mm -hmm. be a voice to those who are struggling in the church and to help people in the church realize that we need to be a little bit more vulnerable when it comes to um, sharing yeah. our experiences during Sunday school and priesthood and really society. It's not just, you know, a simple follow come follow me book you know like i love the come follow me it's a great you know tool and stuff like that and there's great foundation but i feel like you know mm -hmm. how does you know the story of reefs or something like that apply to us today you know like and or you know what allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and stuff like that i mean you know, and kind of like what Calvin said, right? To be lifters and to lift others mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You can't do that if you're not vulnerable. Well, I'm sorry, I feel like I, uh, got dis. Oh, you're okay, Cal. <laughs> I got disconnected there and uh, and missed what you were talking about. But <laughs> the joys of the joys of Wi-Fi, we call that. Yeah. Yes. No, I mean we were kind of talking a little about um, religion and how his religion may have morphed or changed based on the experiences that he went through. And, you know, did he have a kind of a okay. reawakening of the faith and things like that? So, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Do you, yeah. I kind of, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So to put it, yeah. So to put it in perspective, right? Like to this point right now, like I don't mm -hmm. encourage or tell people to stay or leave the church. Right. Um, I think mm -hmm. that the relationship that you have with God is yours alone. And it's something that you need to find out for yourself. Right. I value more my relationship with God and Jesus Christ over institutionalized religion. Like for me, I don't really care if I go to church every Sunday cause I don't need to. What I focus on like is to what's my relationship with God. Like, I I still go to church like every Sunday still like I rarely miss and stuff but you know I don't have that obligation that I must attend every single one of my meetings. I, th this is um, so common by the way. I I think there's so, something with this. Yeah. Everyone I know that goes through something like this with very few exceptions. They go through something really tough and what it really is is that you break, you snap out of the typical mold of of religious living. And the mold is we know it, right? You and and I'm going to use the uh, yeah. LDS Mormon example mm -hmm. for reference but you go up you grow up you live a good clean life you do everything just right you follow everything by the book you go on a mission um you give your service you come home you go to a good church school usually right mm -hmm. you find your wife you get married usually at 20 to 22 you're right um you yeah. you follow this pattern you go go find a good stable job you retire mm -hmm. 
you know, you serve, 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 you die. And whenever that snaps out and whenever something happens that deters you from that typical yeah. path, everybody goes to the same thing. So far in all my experience, divorce, death of a loved one, or with like, especially a spouse, right? Because that shakes you from, you're no longer the typical LDS story anymore, right? Right. You've, you've, you've changed now. You've, mm -hmm. you've had to rethink everything or a serious like pivot right. in your career or something where you didn't follow the path exactly. And you no longer fit the classic mold. And yeah, and it changes everything. And your your brain has to go, okay, wait, what do I really believe now? And is this the institution right. I believe in? Or the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I still have questions mm -hmm. even to this day too. Like, I still have social pressure to even get married again. And for me, it's just like, well, that means yeah. I'm going to have to be sealed again. Yeah. And if I get sealed again, that means I'm going to have two wives in heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that doesn't sound like heaven to me. Like, yeah. Yeah. And so for me, like, and this is something I'm dealing with right now, right? With my therapist and stuff like that. But I am much more rather comfortable marrying someone who is outside of oh, our religion just so that I can yeah, that's what I never thought not that. have yeah, that pressure so of being sealed. That's again. actually a thing for you. So your, your brain's actually geared that way. Yeah. Like I, I already have that spiritual commitment. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that is fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so being in a mixed faith relationship for me, it's just like, it's okay. I mean, it's normal. I mean, I think we as members of the church feel like it's abnormal because we've been classically conditioned to think that, you know, you have to marry someone, you know, of your faith or you have to marry someone right. who isn't. Right. Um, or who is a virgin or who is supposed to be a return missionary, you know? Well, and guys, you have all like, of these returning missionaries. Like oh, you're not? Okay. Again, it's the same thing. Everybody's life is different. Guys that, and here's the worst part about all of it. I mean, and so, I mean, how you don't know much about my story, but um, I was out of the LDS church for hard for about two years. I mean, 100%. I mean, and someone asked me, I remember distinctly actually in Guatemala, funny enough, it's that place seems yeah. to have some kind of effect. Um, and that's where I met Calvin as well. Or that's where, you know, I bonded with Calvin. <laughs> um, right. Someone asked me, they said, do you think you'll ever go back to the church? And I said, if Bingo. the hell will freeze over before I ever go back to the LDS church, right? <laughs> that will never happen. It's a cult. I'm never going back. The funny thing about it is there's so much goodness in it. And that's the problem is everyone polarizes <laughs> so heavily. It's either perfect and there's no fault. It can do no wrong. Everything is by yeah. the book. Everything's crystal clear. Or it is completely a cult and it's leading you down this path of, of brainwashing, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and right. finding, I, I respect, I respect you so much for having found, uh, well, for one, I mean, I, I don't know where you are exactly with your faith, but to still be there, you know, you, you love Christ and God. I mean, that's so typical when people walk away and when that, when that frame snaps, like I was talking yeah. about, people just throw it all away. It's like, oh, don't believe in God. I did it. I'm not going to deny that for a second. I had a similar mm -hmm. thing. I, I snapped out a typical view of what I thought my life should be like as an LDS Mormon boy and yeah. it broke me. And I threw away my belief in God and Christ and everything, which is completely not what I should have done. You know what I mean? There's so much goodness that I gave away because I couldn't fit the mold perfectly anymore. And having that balance right. out of looking at, okay, what do I like? And, you know, what what jives with me? And I find a lot of peace in that too. So, no, that's really interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think the difference between me okay, and you yeah. is just like, um, for me, it was just yeah. like, screw the mold. I'm going to do, I'm going to be the mold or something like that. You know, like okay. I'm going to create my yeah. own path and stuff like, and uh, I'm still going to obey the rules and stuff like that. Cause mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. for me, it's just like, I follow everything that you see on that baptism yeah. or the temple or recommend in every question, right? right? <laughs> All that, like yeah. I agree. Right. But it doesn't say anything about having tattoos, you know, there yeah, and stuff <laughs> or, you know, like it doesn't say you have to be there every single Sunday, you know, um, and so for me, it's just like, I don't care if you serve a mission or not. Like, I don't care if, you know, um, if you leave the church or not, like, oh yeah. And I think that's something that's kind of a heavy topic, especially here in the church. Like, <laughs> that would I, was really just, I mean, you can cut uh, this out uh, or not, but, um, just to go a little bit on like, <laughs> um, but, um, I was really disappointed with that. Uh, what was his name? Brad Wilcox's talk. Um, he gave a talk in an Alpine. Um, it was like a multi-stake like conference and stuff like that. And uh, essentially, 
um, his main message was that you have to be a member of this church because if you leave, then um, where will you go? And uh, like, basically, he made it sound like God will love you less um, or hmm. than uh, if you leave the church than if you stay. And I thought that was just, it broke my heart knowing that because I know that the thing that I've taught on my mission was that God has engraven your name upon his hands. And no matter what religion you are, he still loves you. No matter if, you know, you're LDS, you're gay, you're black or anything, right? God still loves you no matter what. Um, and when I picture, you know, yeah. up in heaven, I, heck like, no. I don't think it's all going to be Mormons. I don't. Cal, Cal what so do you there's think? There's still good people outside. I know you've got a bit of a delay, so you're probably afraid religion. to pipe in. You're worried about and, yeah. and cutting in. But I'm curious, what are your what are your thoughts about all this? I am. Yeah. I have, um, my thoughts are just along that same line. I mean, I believe that heaven's going to be filled with all sorts of people. There's, I mean, having, having, I mean, all of us, we like going to different places. We like to travel, um, and seeing different religions and devotion that people give to, uh, their own god you know whether it be the one that we worship or or the one that they worship there are so many devout people and uh, i believe in the the line like or, or not the line but just the truth that we've all been given something different you know uh we've all been given we're all fed different information um our experience in this life is based off of mm -hmm. how we grew up um, it's, I believe uh, like that we each have our own individual, like divine identity, but at the same time, we've all had such unique experiences and, uh, somebody who believes with such devotion to something else. I mean, why would, why would that even make sense that they would be punished or that they're not as good as somebody else who had the truth, but didn't do anything with it, <laughs> you know, you follow Yeah, I mean, and that's funny enough. One of yeah. the things I, the reason that, one of the big reasons me and Calvin became such good friends was that he lived his religion differently than a lot of people that I knew. I mean, so Calvin met me. I mean, this is this is me being a little vulnerable right now, but Calvin met me at probably one of the lowest points of my life, right? I mean, I I was in a complete right. tailspin spiritually, um, emotionally, career. I mean, you name it, I was pretty much, uh, <laughs> I was kind of a mess in like pretty much every category. And what I love is that Calvin had, was so focused on the most core elements of his faith and not on the culture uh, or what you should do. And there was no judgment, right? Calvin didn't care. I mean, that was so amazing to me because I was so convinced. Oh, he's right. LDS. I'm not acting LDS, right? Or I don't believe it anymore. He's not going to be friends with me. He wouldn't be friends with me, right? And instead it was like, no, like, and I mean, I love it. Actually, I love this in Guatemala too. I remember mm -hmm. I don't know who it was, but one of the members between like every meeting would go out and like just get a smoke and then come back in and nobody cared. <laughs> like nobody cared. And like in a lot of cultures, we, I mean, and this is not just the LDS faith that has this problem. This is every religion. <laughs> we get so caught up in culture and we like to use it as a way to grade ourselves. Uh, the showroom mentality, <laughs> right? Where it's like, all right, who's the most righteous among us? Who Who's going to go above and beyond? Who's the one that's reading, you know, the Bible for 16 hours a day? Right. Totally. It's a bit totally harsh, but I like to say that's like the Pharisees mm -hmm. and Sadducees mentality. No, they won't. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, and I've said that to some members. Especially if you haven't had that snap, like you it. know what I mean? <laughs> and all my friends that have, all of yeah, them have gone through well. that. I mean, just kind of like you're talking about where, I mean, and again, you made the conscious choice as well, right? As you were saying, like you chose to snap out of that mold. Some people are forced out of it. Some people it's because, I mean, I know a lot of my buddies is because they got divorced. And all of a sudden, they're like, this wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't part of the plan. And they have to rethink everything out. A lot of them, they threw away all of it, the entire religion as a way to cope with that pain. Right. But it's happening a lot now. And the, the interesting, dif the big difference now is that in religion generally, and especially in the LDS church, we are having to adapt to it. Because if, I'll tell you right now, if, if there's no adapt adaptation, I'm, the majority of my friends are out of their faith. Actually, like mm -hmm. Calvin is one of, one of my few friends that 
is still an active member of the LDS church. Right. Uh, that a lot of people I even grew up with. I mean, it's, I, I'd say it's probably 60% of my friends are, have nothing to do with the church or don't live it at all or whatever. And that's, again, we're having to readapt the way we see a religion generally is we're all trying, we're all doing our best and that's it. And there is no exact way. There is no, um, uh, I think like Jay Golden Kimball, who was a, a Mormon, um, church leader said, I don't, I don't, I'm not on the street. Yeah. It's funny. Everyone's like, oh, you're using him. Yeah. But, um, he was, he had, he had kind of a, a mouth. He was the only guy that like swore during talks and stuff. Yeah. But he had some great wisdom too. And he said, I don't, I don't stay on the straight and narrow path, but I cross it as often Love as that, I man. can. And I've had a lot of people really criticize that statement because I've said it before. I'm like, oh, that's just not right. I'm like, it might not be for you and that's okay. But yeah. for me, man, I respect crap out of anybody that can cross it as often as they can because they're trying. Like some of us, the best we can do, you know? Yeah. And it's way better than just going off mm. the deep end, you know? So I don't know. That's yeah. that's my that's my little my little pulpit pulpit mm -hmm. moment there. But <laughs> it's true. Um, um, how are you? Maybe you have. Love it. Oh, Go ahead, man. Kel. This is rough. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Brunson. Um, no, you're good. I can't even. I can't even see what time we're at. My uh, computer is uh, the fan kicked on, but um, just to, I I might have to go here a little little soon. But um, Howie, do you have any? Final thoughts. Are are we good to to wrap it up here, Brunson? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Howie? absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just curious. Anything that you'd like to share? Yep. Yeah, so I think the biggest thing that I want to Yeah, so the biggest thing that I kinda wanna share, right, is that you know, based on like the story that I have with grief and vulnerability, um, the biggest thing that I encourage everyone else to do, right, is we all have, we all have gone through, you know, hard things in our life, right? I mean, the pandemic is just a perfect example of, you know, the past two years that we've been having, right? And it's been a struggle for most of us, but, um, if, but I know that every single one of us has a story that we have to share, right? Whether, you know, it's divorce or my wife passed away and something like that, right? Um, and that, um, to let our story, you know, be heard and known, um, because you never know who somebody else is struggling. Like, I really like the scriptures, um, in the book of Mormon where it says like, you know, um, I forget who the people is cause I'm not a scriptorian, but it's like, and mourn with those that mourn and stand in comfort, those that need comforting and stuff like that, you know? So that's the people who understood vulnerability. Those are the people who, um, were you know, judgment free. They never had sacrament and instead of listening to the savior, they were just looking around and seeing um who didn't take the sacrament, you know, and then drawing like an illusion of like, oh yeah, he must be unworthy to take the sacrament or something like that, you know. Um and uh, you know, if people are like, you know, struggling in um with the faith and stuff like that, you know, like it's something that's really common and it's not just our religion, but it's our whole generation and uh, um, I chose to be a different mold than the common Mormon boy. Um, some people choose to leave, you know, some people choose to stick to that mold and that's, the decision is completely uh, up to you. That's however awesome. you well, want to do it. It, really, it yeah. ties all into what's on your wrist right there. You know what I mean? It's hard to lift if you're not willing to be vulnerable. It's hard to lift if you're not willing to be honest. And that's a facade yeah. to put that on there and to pretend that your life is perfect because right. then you can't you can't really lift if you're think you know if you're if you're living that image. So I love that. Mm -hmm. Thanks for joining us today, man. I seriously appreciate it so much. Yeah. Yes, sir. All right, to our listeners, um, thanks for coming and listening. And yeah, uh, we'll I appreciate you for having me. Man. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. As always, I'm not running ads. So the best thing you can do to show thank you if you got any kind of value out of this at all please, please leave a review and share it with your friends. We'll see you on the next episode.